very happy, I'm very happy to have back at Stanford Ryan Kalo. Ryan is a 1999 last century graduate of Dartmouth, <laughs> where he majored in, is that civil philosophy, mechanical philosophy? Yeah, no, just uh, He's been hanging out with one a bunch categories. of engineers for a long time, <laughs> philosophy majors in his graduate. Then spent several years, which must have been quite trying, I hadn't realized this until I looked at your CV, on the New York City Civilian Complaint Board. Mm -hmm. New York City civilians, I'm sure, complain a lot. <laughs> this was about the police department? Yeah, exactly. Then uh, somehow ended up at law school, University of Michigan. Uh, graduated from Michigan in 2005. Clerked for Judge Cole in the Sixth Circuit. Worked for two years at Kevin Burling in D.C. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then spent four years here at Stanford, where he was with our Center for Internet and Society, the last two as Director for Privacy. He is now finishing his first year as an assistant professor at the University of Washington School of Law. I was sorry for Stanford to lose him to anywhere, but at least we lost him to one of the only other two law schools in the country that's on the quarter system. So, mm -hmm. Small comfort. Ryan totally yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, works on privacy, but he also manages to do something that I find admirable, or at least enjoyable, or at least what I like to do. He, he works on any cool thing that he sees. So he works on robots, he works on autonomous cars, he works on drones, he works on all sorts of cool stuff. And today, he will be talking about exploding brains. Right? Yeah. The table is yours. Wow. Thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. Good to see everyone. So the last couple, speaking of robots, the last couple of days, the reason uh, apart from to talk to you today that I'm in town, uh, is because there's a bunch of events going on for National Robotics Week. And so National Robotics Week is, you know, this sort of recognized by Congress, the Robotics Caucus, um, as a week every year where you sort of celebrate and think about the impact of robotics in the United States, right? And so there's events all over the country. There's hundreds of them. Um, we have long at Stanford been a real anchor event uh, with the Robot Block Party which is happening at Vail, um, the, the automotive uh, building here on campus. And there will be you know, dozens of huge you know, robotic companies showing off robots. It's just a, a sort of celebration of technology. And that's going on today between 1 and 6. The last couple of days, I was um, uh, chairing a conference on robotics and the law where we, <coughs> here on campus again, where we talked about things like you know, intellectual property. We had um, uh, Julie Samuels from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Mark uh, Lemley here on the faculty. Uh, just sort of, z and, and others zeroing in on the questions, uh, unique questions, uh, arguably, that, uh, that, that ro the emerging robotics industry presents um, for intellectual property, um, and, and, and various, other, uh, various other things, driverless cars uh, came up, uh, for instance, repeatedly. Um, but as Hank said, basically, you know, I'm sort of emerging technology and law and policy, and so I sort of look for anything that I think is, is interesting. And the way that this particular, you know, a journal club uh, came up, is that I was approached by the folks at the University of Washington who do a lot of, um, of this, you know, not exploding brains, hopefully, but uh, brain um, machine interface work. Um, and so what they did is they, they kind of said, you know, would you like to be, you know, maybe small 5% or something on a couple of, NS of NSF grants around this work? Um, uh, would you like to be on a dissertation committee for, for one of our electrical engineers who works on this work? And so as a consequence, I've started been reading up on it. And I thought I would take this opportunity uh, as this is one of the, despite the variety of things I work on, this is um, one of the few places where I would say that I, uh, that my, at least my current thinking is, is uh, in the sort of wheelhouse for the Center for Law and Biosciences, right? Um, and talk a little bit about it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you just to, you know, probably stuff you largely know about, uh, about brain-computer interfaces, um, uh, talk a little bit about the you know, really sort of early days burgeoning literature around the privacy and security issues that they arguably uh, present, um, and, uh, and, and then describe one of these particular papers in a little more detail. Um, and then I just want to back up and just sort of comment, uh, not about the space itself, not about brain-machine interfaces, but sort of about how uh, privacy scholars, security scholars, you know, the, the press, lawmakers uh, uh, tend to sort of look at emerging technology that has an implication for privacy and security. Um, and talk a little bit about how brain machine, uh, you know, uh, brain computer interfaces might, might play into that dynamic, which is, I think, right now a very, very interesting one. 
Um, and so a brain-computer interface, obviously, um, uh, in a, in a, to some extent, everything is a brain-computer interface, right? Uh, you know, you're using your brain, uh, and there's a couple of levels of mediation, but, you know, that's what's going on. You're interacting with the machine. This is a little more of a direct route uh, right to your brain, right? And so, you know, you can imagine... Uh, and so the basic idea is that you're controlling some digital aspect, some aspect of a computer or other machine directly with, um, with your brain. Um, they tend to take two different kinds of forms. Um, some are, are, are invasive, um, sometimes called semi-invasive, but invasive, like literally there might be drilling into your head. Um, you know, when I was um, here at Stanford, I, I don't know if it was at your invitation, Hank, but you remember that was that great um, presentation by someone here on Stanford that was doing the... Uh, you know, direct invasive brain uh, machine stuff for prosthetic purposes. And there, you know, the advantage of drilling through the head, there are disadvantages to drilling through the head. <laughs> the, the advantages, uh, I won't dwell on them, the advantages of drilling through the head is that you get a really direct, you know, sort of quick connection and you get really, you know, sort of a great latency and, and so forth. Um, today I'm going to be talking largely about, really on the other side of the spectrum, very non-invasive, right? So this is just sort of like a, a little um, uh, sort of net that goes over your head that kind of um, detects brain activity. Uh, most of these techniques uh, leverage something that I may mispronounce, but it's electroencephalography, right, EEG. Um, and the idea is, is that you're looking for an event-related potential, meaning you're, you're, you're looking for, for uh, some recognition on the part of the brain that it's seen the stimulus before, right? And so the way that this works, and again, I am vastly oversimplifying, but the way that this works essentially is that you train um, you, you train on someone's brain so you start to recognize um, the signals that it sends off or the patterns that it sends off um, you know, when, when you've arrived at some moment of recognition. And you do that through a training module. Um, and then you go ahead and do experimentation or have other kinds of controls once you sort of get a sense for this particular person's brain, right? So for instance, you do a training um, a module where you show a picture of the letter A and you say, um, you know, think of the letter A and then when, when you, you watch the change and then later on you can maybe use that to spell by, you know, once you recognize all the different letters and then you can use it as a kind of word processor. Again, this is vastly oversimplified, but that's the basics of the way that it, that it works uh, as I understand it. Um, and so uh, you're using EEG to look for ERP, right? And so, um, and again, also the thing I'm going to talk about today largely is, is um, the, the commercially available technology, of which there is actually quite a lot, right? And so in particular, um, gaming environments. I remember when I saw this for the first time at the computer, uh, the consumer electronics show a couple of years ago when they were demoing the, the video game The Force. You guys know this, this video game? So it's a Star Wars-based video game. Um, where you like literally control things with your mind, right? So you're running around with a little controller, and then you know, you, but you, well, you want to be able to use the force, uh, and there's no force button, it turns out. And so you wear this thing on your head, um, and basically you can like incinerate people or shoot lightning by thinking about it, right? And so the first time you see it, it's, it's amazing. You incinerate people and shoot lightning. On the game, right, <laughs> not in actuality, right, right. But it's a short leap, it's a, sh it's a, sh it's a short leap, as we'll talk about it, as we'll talk about it. I'm going to do a demo. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, 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 but the point, the, but, but, but the point of the matter is, is that it, it's amazing, and, and one of the things they had set up a consumer electronics to sort of dramatize this, you for a, this for you for a moment was they had like a ping pong ball where it had a, a small amount of, um, of air would be blown from the bottom, and so the ping pong ball was at the bottom of the thing. And, and so the more you thought, the harder you thought about that ping pong ball sort of rising up, the more it would actually do so. And it's like, you know, it's indistinguishable from magic, right? This is a sort of line. I mean, it, it feels that way. Uh, but it's widely available. The other thing, I think, really interesting thing is that not only can you get this relatively inexpensive, commercially available, you know, technology, uh, but what is a phenomenal and, and interesting and important is the fact that there is an app store for this stuff. Right, and so just the way that there's an app store for your computer, an app store for um, uh, your your smartphone, uh, folks are like just you know sort of realizing that this has potential and writing all kinds of different apps. So in the mean, in the time before that, sort of like you know the Force was one of the first applications, you know the early you know, prosthetics and so forth. You know now who knows how this will be applied, right? Because people are coding on top of it, and that's actually a nice advantage of a sort of open technology technological platforms of all kinds. The fact that you can uh, that that the people that make the brain wave reader don't have to come up with all the innovative uses to which you can put it, right? And that and that makes sense, right? So. 
The other problem, of course, with having an open environment like this is that folks can get up to mischief. So just so you can get up to innovation, you can get up to bad innovation, you can get up to, 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 to problematic uses. Um, and even were that not the case, um, you, you know, when you're talking about reading people's thoughts at one level, you're going to have some folks asking questions about privacy and security. Um, and sure enough, there's like this really kind of burgeoning, I wouldn't quite call it a cottage industry yet, but there's this sort of burge burgeoning literature around, around uh, so-called neurosecurity, which is a, you know, as far as I can tell, and Hank, you may know better, but as far as I can tell, this was coined by uh, people like Yoshi Kono at UW and, and Tamara Denning in a paper from 2009, uh, but I'm sure that it has um, sort of earlier, um, earlier uh, uh, you know, science fiction literature, for instance, is probably an obvious source of, 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 the, of the idea of neurosecurity. But the basic idea is that you could use these interfaces and interact directly with the brain, and that and somehow you could either uh, find out things about people or, or, or cause their brains to explode or something along those lines, right? And so you got this paper from a few years ago talking about the issue of neurosecurity, and that's it, right? Just basically talking about how this might be an issue. Um, and so what, what I want to focus on, though, is um, a proof of concept paper from just last year um, that I think is actually, there's a link to it, but it's by uh, Martinovich and, and some colleagues. Um, and I mean, actually, title is right here. It's on the feasibility of side channel attacks with brain computer interfaces. And so rather than just speculate about um, the possibility for, for a neurosecurity problem, they actually go ahead and, and try to evidence that as a proof of concept, right? And so again, my really simplistic example of what this is, you train the brain and then you use that training in order to sort of, you know, have the brain control some, some function. And, and there's an app store. And so what they show is that you could, you could get up to sort of all sorts of mischief with this. And, and the proof of concept that they dwell on has to do with banking security. And so if you think about it, the, the, the attack is relatively simple. You have, you, have this piece of, you have a piece of software that looks like it's a fun you know, game, but in fact it's a piece of brain spyware. Okay, and what it does is it, you know, it's, you, you think you're gonna be able to, to just fire these really um, uh, irritated uh, birds um, uh, and, and with your mind, which I, who wouldn't want to do that? Um, but and then you do both of the training module. Um, and, but the, the training module is sort of weird. Like, I, I don't know, why is it? I don't know. It's flashing sort of strange things at me. It's flashing like um, uh, 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 pictures of banks and pictures of, of, of credit cards and things like that. And so, what, by this expedient, what they do is they train the brain to to, to see to figure out how to detect when there's been recognition, right? And then they show you logos of banks or pictures of credit cards uh, and, and use that to guess what your bank is. And they do the same sort of technique with PIN numbers. And they do the same sort of technique with your, your physical location, your same sort of technique with, um, with uh, 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 um, uh, your date of birth, right? Um, and by this expedient, they're actually able to, and it's not very reliable on this particular incarnation, um, it's, it's between uh, 10 and at their very best 40% uh, better than guessing, right? But what they point out is that if you were to refine this technique and or have some background knowledge about the individual, um, you could refine that quite a bit. And so the idea is literally that you can figure out personal, highly personal details about people um, by showing them a bunch of options and, and, and getting them to zero in on it. Right, um, and so it's a pretty sort of straightforward, at least on one level. I mean, the, you know, the, the sort of the math is hard, and it's not a, an easy experiment uh, to to do. But at the end of the day, the concept is pretty is pretty clear, and they, and and, and they, have, they get a statistically uh, interesting enough result from it that you could imagine it being refined. Um, so that's one threat model. Um, I sort of been thinking about other threat models, some of which I sort of read, some of which I made up. I'll give you one that I made up. So. The other, you know, apart from malicious hackers trying to get information out of you for some reason, right? You might imagine um, uh, government uh, uses, right? So you might imagine somehow the government wanting to have information about, you know, some in intentional state, you know, um, and and just and and you know, we can sort of imagine a kind of clockwork orange style situation where you're being interrogated. Um, and, and they're just showing you a picture of the crime scene and so forth, and your brain betrays you, and we can talk about whether that's, inc you know, incriminating thoughts and so forth, and folks like Nita Farahani have written some really sophisticated stuff. But let me give you just even more of a basic thing, like, so, and, and, and maybe something that's even sort of even more politically palatable. 
which I, which I think I made up. So imagine that everybody's using these devices now. It's the new gaming platform, and all these people, you know, usually within the ages of like 18 and 34, all of whom are, are, are or mo many of whom are male, although certainly not everyone, but lots and lots of people are using these devices, right? Um, and a little girl gets kidnapped. A little girl gets kidnapped. And so what happens is that they're using these devices and they're all connected to one another and they're playing in massively multiplayer online. And all of a sudden the game stops and there's a picture of the little girl. Okay? It's an amber alert, a brain amber alert. And every time they get a hit on that, they investigate it. But based on your IP address. I, I want to find that little girl. I want to find that little girl, right? And so this is a sort of amber alert, you know, detection system. And you could do that with anything, right? So you could, and by the way, you don't have to necessarily find something incriminating. Did you see that girl today? Do you recognize that girl? And then you use that to zero in on something. And, and I mention that in part because, as, as Hank said, I talk about drones a lot. And so when I, I was testifying in the Senate before the Senate Judiciary Committee a couple weeks ago, and the police and uh, the law enforcement person wanted to give an example of, uh, of how these technology drones could be used that was, that was going to be resonate with the senators. So what did he pick? He picked finding a lost little girl. You know what I mean? So it's like you sort of finding a, a, a lost kid, right? So it's, it's really, it really resonates. And so that's why I picked that particular example. I, I think that that's actually sort of more plausible than, than, um, than you might think. Um, and then there's the possibility of sort of, so mostly what I've been focusing on is um, a kind of one-way street where you're extracting information through this particular method from the brain. Uh, but there's also the possibility of as a two-way interaction, something that, that actually something I read of Stephen Wu uh, uh, and Mark Goodman uh, pointed out, um, where you could also imagine uh, trying to affect, affect the brain. And so let me give you a couple examples of those that, that might be plausible. So lest you think that this is the kind of thing, like really, someone's going to try to hurt you with your brain? You know what I mean? It just seems kind of crazy. Well, think about the examples from what? 2007, March, and 2008, December, right? Where uh, hackers went on to an epilepsy support group and hacked it to flash a series of images to cause epileptic seizures. If people like that exist in the world, why wouldn't people exist in the world who would want to hack into a you know, brain interface and cause you to, to you know, instead of, instead of the bully sort of uh, hitting um, uh, your, your tray table out of your, out of your hands in the lunchroom, they, they just use their mobile phone to hack into your prosthetic and cause you to fly. I mean, you know, the, but the point of the matter is, is that you can imagine that. I think a more plausible scenario still is to the extent that, that you're using things like um, deep brain stimulation and so forth to sort of uh, equal people, like to sort of regulate people's moods and the like, and to sort of help people level out, um, you could imagine self-hacking situations where there's a kind of brain interface that the individual themselves could access to and puts themselves in a better mood, right? And so these are sorts of things that I think are, are real threat models that we sort of have to, to have to guard against. Um, the third paper it is really not even a paper uh, by uh, Tamara Bonacci and, and Howard um, Chisick at UW. It's more of a sort of, you know, what, what can we do about this? And they suggest a sort of privacy by design, which is designing these interfaces in a way that, that um, uh, tends to, to mitigate against these kinds of, of threats if that's possible. But they don't give a lot of detail there. I think it's for a future project. So. Um, you know, that's it. That's all I want to say. I mean, there's so much more to say about all this stuff, but, but I, I just want to sort of uh, uh, give you a thumbnail sketch of, of this technology and where, some of the, where it could go wrong. And then I just want to ta use it as an example uh, of a broader discussion about emerging technology and privacy and security. Um, I, I, something that I think is sort of relentlessly interesting, something that's really interesting to me is, you know, it feels like every time a new, a new uh, uh, um, kind of technology comes out, people decide they're going to they're hack it, they're going to show what's wrong with it, they're going to show reflexively why it's a privacy problem. Similarly with technologies you've had uh, around for a very long time, people are ingenious, security researchers are ingenious about coming up with ways that they could compromise your privacy. I heard a, um, a, a talk a couple of years ago at the Electronic Frontier Foundation about how you could use like a really powerful listening device and, and some really powerful data, you know, some algorithms in order to figure out what people are typing on the basis of, you, you know what I mean? It's like people come up with this stuff, it's like, who thinks of that, right? So security researchers have thinks of that, you know? And, and, and if ever that's actually a threat model that hackers are really gonna use, 
The only way it would be possible that they really used that probably is the fact that they, they read about it by the security researcher who published it, right? And so, I mean, so you wonder a little bit about that. And I think that there are questions that, that go to the heart of this. And so I think that, I think there's kind of, um, so there's a question maybe of if, I mean, so these kind of questions of whether to do certain kinds of research, I tend to fall squarely in the camp of we should do the research, right? So, you know, research on like, what is it, avian flu, is that too dangerous? Like, I think we should do the research um, for lots of reasons we can talk about. And then for me, it's more sort of about when to do it um, uh, and, and, and sort of how to do it. And so, and so, as you can see, right, so people are speculating about neural security a few years ago. They're doing the proof of concept in 2012. Um, and they're publishing their results. Um, and, I, and I sort of, again, this is just my spitball thinking, but it's sort of like, I think you should sort of, you should come up with three different layers here. So talk about like when to test as against security vulnerabilities from emerging technology, when to reveal the results, and then when affirmatively to criticize. Those are these phases that I've sort of artificially come up with. And I think that you should test, for instance, uh, you know, brain-computer interfaces for security vulnerabilities immediately. I think you should do it immediately. Um, now, these people who make this stuff are trying to solve a problem, and they're trying to innovate, and they're trying to do it the best way. It's just hard, hard, hard stuff. And so the idea that you'd have to start from the very beginning and only pursue those methods that could never be compromised, I mean, that's, that's crazy. But at the same time, in parallel, sort of concurrent planning, I do think that you should start to look at the privacy and security issues immediately. When to reveal when you found something strange? I, I, I really am a firm believer, and this comes from my work in sort of internet consumer privacy stuff, that you should reveal things, if at all, in, in stages, right? And so you should sort of reveal it to the, to the little small community, maybe to the manufacturer, maybe the folks that are working on this, and sort of only escalate um, as, as the problems get solved. And so if you can contain it, but still eventually go, go public, because that is where you get a lot of bang for your buck, I think you should sort of be, be, be cognizant of, of the fact that you should reveal security vulnerabilities in stages so that people aren't saying, oh, wow, that sounds like a great idea. I'm going to write uh, some brain spyware uh, the, tomorrow. Um, and then finally, when should you criticize? I think what you, you know, really when you should come out and say this is a problem and so forth is actually the point at which the, the technology is commercially available, right, um, and has been sold without adequate security. And so just to give you an example of that, um, the same team actually, Yoshi and Tamra and a couple other people, um, we had them out to talk about the security of household robotics. And, and what happened was we, th that they wrote this great paper about household robotics and how um, if you had a robot in your house that was connected to the internet, as many commercially available ones are, not only could the hacker um, see what and hear what the robot hears and sees, but they could also take over the robot and, and cause it to go drive around and things like this. And the reason that was possible was, was, was several fold, one of which was the IP signature was unique, and so you could drive around a neighborhood and figure out what the who, you know what was a robot and what wasn't right and second of all it was completely in the clear it was unencrypted right and and sort of that seems like an enormous oversight to me and, until i sort of read about how the cia had an unencrypted you know drone footage when we were flying around gathering intelligence so that when they caught insurgents they would have like a video from our drones on their laptops right so i mean people make these kinds of mistakes but i think that's the point at which you criticize um, and then, you know, and then lastly, and again, this is just really preliminary sort of, um, not, back, not back of the envelope, but sort of back of the Office Depot sort of thinking, but um, is sort of, you know, when did the situations like this get traction, when did they get addressed, right? Um, you know, when, um, um, when do you get um, uh, attention by, by the Judiciary Committee? And, and so there I want to just make a couple quick remarks, and then I'm going to end, and, and hopefully we can, we can talk about this a little more. Um, I think we're like, I think that, that the kinds of privacy issues that are presented by brain uh, machine interfaces and by drones and by some of the other things we're seeing these days, I think they're going to they're gonna have more and more oomph. So if you, if you go back to sort of when the whole privacy law movement started in the United States, you can sort of trace it back to like 1890 with the publication of the right to privacy, Warren and Brandeis and so forth. And what happened there was that Warren and Brandeis write this paper and they say, you know, um, once upon a time, in order for you to take a picture of somebody, they had to pose for it, 
right? They had to stay there for a literally long time. Like, not only did you have to consent, you had to cooperate. But then what happens, you know, around that time is that the invention of snap photography, instantaneous photography, and suddenly someone can take a picture of you against your will. And that's when it becomes possible for them to take pictures of your daughter's wedding and splash them on the front page of, of, of the newspaper, right? And this was supposed to really agitate people, and it, and it did. But if you think about sort of the key, the sort of buzzwords that are happening, in the, and, and you think about the cultural context a little bit for this. So we're talking about snap photography. We're talking about pace. We're talking about the pace of the world going too fast with urbanization and industrialization. People are really concerned about how the pace of things is changing on them. And it's worrisome. They feel it viscerally. And second of all, you're talking about class. You're talking about the possibility of, um, of, uh, uh, of all the, the, the ruffian you know, uh, masses getting access to, to the facts of the lives of, of, of people who are, who are in the upper class. And this is also something at the time, and even today, but at the time especially was really, was really resonating. And so given the cultural context, I, that shift in technology strikes me as, as, um, uh, as an obvious catalyst, right? Um, but then for years and years and years, and particularly sort of in the digital age, it became extremely difficult to form a mental model of what a privacy violation looks like, right? So if you think about computers and, I mean, what does a privacy violation look like today um, or, or two years ago? It's like some pieces of information are being sort of correlated somewhere in some server maybe, and then maybe you get charged slightly higher price for something, or maybe you don't get on a plane one day. You know, so you, it, it's really difficult for you to envision what privacy harm looks like, right? But things like drones, I think, um, are much easier to visualize. And I think that things like robotics, I mean, you can really form a mental model of what the harm and, and process of surveillance by drone is like. And I think that's why it's been such an enormous catalyst. Um, so things like flight, you know, since Icarus, we've been obsessed with flight. So things like robots that are sort of inscrutable and somewhat like us to the point that people like Peter Kahn think that they need their own separate ontological category, which I think may be going a little far, but is interesting. Um, and so forth. And then you have like the brain, right? The brain, like, oh my God, they're gonna read my thoughts, right? And so this, this sort of return to hardware, uh, this fact that we're sort of poking at things that have sort of, I think, deep-seated, um, easy to sort of visualize, accessible, available um, uh, fears within people means that actually that's why you see privacy heating up the way, the way, that, you, the way that it does. And many people talk about it as though, well, we've just collected so much information now that that's why the levee's finally broken. But I actually don't think that's right. You know, I, I think that you regulate technology, you get concerned about technology to the extent that you can visualize it, and the extent that it hits on these, on these, you know, these beliefs and these sort of deep-seated um, human issues. Which is why, again, I have this sort of tentative idea that I'd like to look at this space more closely, in part to study how it unfolds and how it resonates with the public and, and lawmakers and so forth. Um, uh, incidentally, it might also cause us to question things like openness being a good value. So the, I said before that we're, you know, we, we, we tend to think of openness, like um, we tend to like Android better than iTunes maybe or I, the iPhone st app store because at the app store, you know, maintains all this control, whereas Android's open ecosystem and anybody can contribute to it. It's so much more innovative and that's why Android's doing better than Apple now and so forth. We tend to, we tend to be um, against um, a net neutrality. I, I know I am. I know that... Uh, 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 Barbara here on the faculty is um, because we, we want to promote openness as a value. Uh, but then when you start to give things like, you know, brain spyware, do we then re-examine that, that kind of value? Because I don't mean to limit it to, to privacy. Um, but yeah, so anyway, that is, that is my, you know, you know, back of the envelope thinking, and I'd love to talk about this a little bit with you guys today. Yeah. So let me say a couple of things. Yeah. Um, some of which are actually more program events. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Two of which are really very directly relevant to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. our, one of our student-affiliated groups, Signal, the standard interdisciplinary group on neuroscience and law, is in conjunction with my seminar on law and neuroscience, having three Stanford neuroscientists speak back, back, back Mondays in the afternoon, the 22nd of April, the 29th of April, and May 6th. Mm -hmm. 22nd is Anthony Wagner talking about using fMRI to detect memories or detect recognition of memories. That's less immediately relevant to you because fMRI is big, clunky, expensive, difficult, unlikely to be done surreptitiously. 
On the 29th, though, Jamie Henderson, a neurosurgeon uh, here, will be talking about brain-computer interfaces, mm. which he's been working on in the prosthetic context. And on May 6, Joseph Carvisi, a neurologist here, will be talking about implantable devices that he's <coughs> innovating to both detect an imminent epileptic seizure and short circuit and prevent that seizure mm. by triggering electrical firings inside your brain. Uh, those will be, the rooms are yet to be uh, announced, yet to be decided, uh, but there'll be 415, 515, and 415 for the three of them on those three Mondays. Um, everything you said, Ryan, is true, I think. Mm. And for those of you who haven't been following the neurospace all that closely, this may seem very science fiction yet. Yeah. You have to dial back some of your understanding to some of the terms. The EEG stuff is not going to allow us to accurately read minds very much. It won't be able to say, ah, bacon cheeseburger. Um, it's really very limited signal. But there are some things it's pretty good at, like recognition, through what's called the P300 um, response. Mm -hmm. the, um, and there's a toy out there that Nita Farahani talks about wanting to put on her students that I find attractive, the Japanese uh, cat ears. So you wear the cat ears, and when you're paying attention, the ears stand up. <laughs> you're not paying attention, the ears lie flat. Yeah, yeah, I like which, it. Which uh, does have, I think, some privacy implications. <laughs> but I co-authored a, a chapter on some of the lie detection possible uses of the with a guy named Peter Rosenfeld mm -hmm. from Northwestern, who's quite good at this. And he has a different paper that we discuss in the chapter that I wasn't involved in. But they gave a bunch of people scenarios of possible terrorist attacks to read. Each person got one scenario, a different kind of weapon, a different city, a different time. Put them in the EEG and read off a bunch of city names and showed them bombs and, and missiles and other sorts of things. And we're able with high degree of accuracy to figure out which scenario that person had read by looking for this recognition signal, which is something easily accessible by EEG and easily accessible in, in the way that these external devices, these external toys work. Um, the Parvisi thing is one of, an ex of a number of ways in which there will be brain implantable devices for medical purposes but then which might be hacked into for people by non-medical purposes. And I think it may have been Yoshi. It was somebody from the University of Washington came down here to give a talk for us four or five years ago about, among other things, implantable defibrillators. Yeah, that was Yoshi. Yeah, his lab does that work. Yeah. I mean, so, so I was going to say, though, um, just, to, just to push back a little bit, um, not, not push back, but it's a relatively few number of people that are going to have these embedded devices, right? Whereas, whereas I think lots of people are gamers, right? And so I feel like shouldn't we be talking a little bit about, you know, how, how do you get to, at the gamers? And, I, I yeah. think both of those are right. Well. Although, frankly, in my demographic, you might see more people with the implantable devices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The eighty-year-old plus female demographic, I think you definitely see more people with the implantable devices. And gamers, yeah. If you, if you begin to add up, say, epilepsy. Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. maybe Alzheimer's, a uh, variety of other neurological ailments, for none of which are there yet. Well, actually, for Parkinson's, there is a FDA approved implantable device, but for most of them, there are not yet implantable devices, but people are working on them. Yeah. As well as people with, with prosthetics that are brain controlled, which people are also working on. Um, the, the work on defibrillators, they discovered, similar to the robot thing, that these things were not encoded. They were not password protected. They had test modes. You could make the defibrillator fire. And basically, anybody who wanted to, who was near enough, you had to be within about 15 feet, I think, near enough to somebody who had one of these implantable defibrillators and had the control, had a control thing, a generic control thing for that type of implantable defibrillator to give somebody an artificial heart attack anytime they wanted to. That's, that will be a much, probably, a much smaller market than the game market. Uh, although, but know, still, in the game market, yeah. if you're worried about it, you can decide not to play games that have a mental, have a brain connection. If you 
you've got epilepsy and you don't want to have seizures, you may not have the sorts of choices that people would have in the gray market. So yeah. Yeah. just mm -hmm. to say this is all um, very, very realistic, if not today in large scale, in three to five years in large scale, both on the medical and the gaming side. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, on, on the flip side, uh, I could see a scenario with where someone might willingly waive their privacy uh, with, say, something like subvocal communication. Mm. Um, you know, there's devices that have been created so that if you just have even a small strip on your throat, it takes a while to train. I don't know how far advanced it's been. It was started a few years ago in, in NASA. Mm -hmm. um, but where you could have, say, somebody cheating on exams or, you know, cheating on their test or, you know, sort of lying under oath or um, sort of reforming their testimony. Um, so I thought that was maybe another That's interesting, aspect yeah. to, to consider. Yeah. Yeah. And, and where you, you know, we, and it wouldn't be necessarily permanent. It would be something that could be used pretty surreptitiously, I would think. Mm -hmm. Agreed, yeah. Absolutely. Let me just go this way. Uh, do, do, do James. Um, I was curious, I mean, the sort of history of hacking shows us that what hackers tend to go after are the, the cheap, easy markets, you know, the widest markets. It's why we see more hacking of Windows than, than iOS to this day. So I guess I'm, I'm curious about a, a couple things. You know, do you think that there's a big risk here before we get to the point where there's wide scale use? Or do you think that there's sort of a greater potential of the sort of per invasion? Um, sort of resets that those, those economics to some degree, and then I guess I was also curious what kind of uses you see driving this. What will be the sort of the killer app of brain interfaces? Um, and, and you mean that in the, in the figurative, not uh, not literal. No, you're, you're not talking about a threat model. You're talking about what's going to really make this stuff, you know, sort of. Well, I, so I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'd love to hear other people's views about this. Um, I, I would say that um, that these, uh, none of these um, uh, threat models, including if you want to, if sort of le sort of legitimate or or that is to say, approved of government uses, like the like the, the Amber system. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see these rolling out anytime soon. I don't see this 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 scaling up anytime soon. Um, uh, but at the same time, nor is this a situation like so with the um, uh, medical devices that Hank was talking about and with the robots that Yoshi was talking about before, um, you know what you can do? You can do better security. Do, do, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, how about not having the stuff be in the clear? Um, and so if we think that even down the line that there's going to be, um, that there's going to be the possibility of widespread uh, uh, sort of hacking uh, about this, and I'll tell you why I think that, that this might be an area where, where you would see a change to the dynamic that you mentioned before. Um, uh, I'm not sure how we solve against it. In other words, if the whole purpose of, it's a whole method here is to get people to recognize something, and the P300 is exactly what they used in this, in this particular threat. But if, they, but if the whole purpose of it is to get you to sort of recognize, have valence to it, so that you can then control things, um, make people explode in a video game or you know, lightning or whatever it happens to be, um, then it seems like there's always going to be the possibility of showing them something that you want to detect. Um, and so I'm not sure how we guard against it. Now I'm told by, by Howard and, and the, the, the co-authors of that Privacy by Design abstract that there are interesting methods that you can put into place. I just haven't sort of seen them yet. Now why would, why would hackers do this? Like they go after um, uh, PCs more than Macs because there's more of them. I think part of, it's got to be a calculation. It's like people take greater risks to get more valuable information, right? Um, and if we think that people are storing their PIN numbers or their banks and things like that in the cloud or whatever else or they're, you know, on their devices, that's going to be the place that where folks go, right? If we think there's things here that you might be able to get at that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise, um, which is why I think talking about the government is important, um, then, then I can see people devoting more resources to get at that information. But I tend to agree with you that if they can find, I mean, I have no idea why you'd bother to go into someone's just if you, maybe if you thought it was cool. I mean, honestly, some of this stuff might happen because folks think it's interesting and cool to be able to do it, and that's a non-trivial risk. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, did you ask? Uh, no, no. I think that was, that was a, I, I think the question. last thing was just sort of like, what, what, what do you, what are sort of the killer apps, right? Yeah. Driving this, driving this 
Well, I mean, I think obviously for those set of people who, who can't act on the world in the absence of it, right, that's going to be a huge thing, right? But that's a relatively small um, part of the population. But for those people, this is a game changer. Um, and that's going to be really important. And then sort of once we deploy it for those people, I think entertainment is going to be by far the more, the more likely way. I think, people, I think people like the idea that they could be able to walk. I mean, people sort of like the same reason they like Harry Potter. You know, I mean, wouldn't you like to be able to walk into your house and sort of point at things? You know, I mean, or or or, or was it um, uh, the what's the name of the uh, Fantasia, uh, the uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice? You know what I mean? Like, wouldn't you be able to come in and be able to gesture at things? I mean, it's just really, really, really neat. Um, and I think that's going to be doing a lot of work. And I think the killer apps are going to be things that people think are just whiz bang cool here. Um, did you have your yeah? Yeah, I, I, mean, I appreciate your decision to stick to what's here and not speculate. Mm. But because the, what's now called the Brain Initiative is so clearly articulated, the goal of a two-way high bandwidth interface to the brain, and particularly the na nanoscience community, is all about non-invasive or minimally invasive high bandwidth you know, reading of what's happening in the brain. It seems like it's going to get less speculative very rapidly. I, I don't doubt that at all. And you know, it's funny because um, I, I don't know why I have this gut intuition. Um, uh, it, this is much less about the substance and more about me personally, so <laughs> thanks for indulging. Uh, but I don't know why I have this gut intuition, but like, I tend to really care about the hearing. I, I tend to think that the immediate commercial issues are, are fascinating with some of this technology. And so it's not that I would deny that the long-term implications, even if they're not so long-term, are really fascinating. Um, but for me, it's like there's so much there right now. Like this possibility of brain spyware or the kind of mischief that some of these things, it's, it's like it happen really soon. And I have that same gut with, with robotics. And so this, this you know, a couple day conference that I, that I just shared, like it, we, we, we focus on the immediate commercial prospects of robotics, not because there aren't fascinating issues about what happens when artificial intelligence gets good enough that X, Y, and Z, you know, not because um, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about what happens when there's a robot in every home, but because like this industry is like trying to get off off the ground and there's legal and policy issues in the way, you know what I mean? And so um, I don't deny that that is fascinating and yeah. Mm -hmm. There's just one more because there was a nature paper based on Stanford work today that I just loved about mm. turning brains transparent. And the hint in that, and, and then being able to read out both mouse brains and human brains, they've done already. And then being able to read out things about the state of the brain after the fact. And that's sort of one of those things about sort of what can go wrong, will go wrong. I mean, you can imagine that you, you'd be able to extract memories or something like that from a brain after, after the fact, um, which is kind of, kind of interesting. It's very interesting, and also I think our public reaction to that is interesting. You know what I mean? I mean, I think that's going to have a, I think people reading that Nature article, they're going to have a high va valence response to that, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yes, Steve. Uh, so when I give talks about uh, brain computer interface issues, I show some videos, one of which is a handicapped person who's paralyzed from the neck down, and he's got a device attached directly to his brain, and he can control a cursor on a screen and click on things with his thoughts alone, and he could type um, or play Pong, you know, that old video game. So that's, that's the beginning part that you were yeah, talking mm -hmm. about. Um, there is also a video out there of a German company that uh, has trained people. You were talking about the training process. When you're, when you're going through this training process, you think left, right, left, right. And what they do is they attach this device to your head when, once you've trained the system so you can actually drive a car. So the video shows somebody using the steering wheel with the thoughts alone, steering left and right. You know, so that's another application. And then another thing that I've seen people working on is, uh, gee, I'm, I'm, I don't want to use a mouse on my computer. Why can't I use my thoughts to be able to move the cursor around the screen non-invasively and click on things? So, mm -hmm. you know, that might actually be a killer app. Oh, yeah, just a sort of basic uh, moving a mouse around. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good point. Uh, it, like the Dragon uh, software for speech recognition, you know, if you combine that with brain, I mean, you can imagine uh, being able to work faster on a computer. But I think the ultimate killer Ven app Ventriloquism. You're going to agree. Yeah. Is that, yeah. <laughs> really helps ventriloquism. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. But, but ultimately, I think that the killer app, if you said what's the, down the road, and I, and I don't mean to move into the speculative, but being able to control information technology with your thoughts. So if you said, hey, can you send me that, that PDF on that, that uh, academic paper on such and such, I can be able to think, OK, it's on its way. To be able to think, yeah, right. send it on to you. Um, and ultimately, to move our memories into the cloud. If I can somehow store images, or uh, if I have a life logger hanging around my neck that's taking constant images, to, move, to be able to visualize that stuff and move that off into storage, uh, eventually the cloud could hold some of my memory. So 
I don't have to forget anything if I don't want to, unless I want to. And to be able to access the, a life's worth of information that's in the cloud that I've been able to perceive, process with my brain, and move off into storage and be able to access that whenever I want to, I think that's really the killer map. It's going to respond. I mean, that, that those are those are fascinating. Yeah, and so I mean, again, just to back to this again, this is completely just sort of made up taxonomy. But to the idea of like sort of when to do these things, I, I think that when you're trying to solve as difficult a problem of how do we store memories or things like that, right? Um, that you don't necessarily want those people. You, you don't necessarily even want those people to be thinking about the privacy and security. I know it sounds strange to say, but you don't necessarily want them because you want them to try to solve this problem. But you want people to be doing it in parallel, or, or, or just sort of shift it. You know what I mean? Like just just in parallel, so that p other people are thinking about that. And then at the point of deployment and commercialization and so forth, that's when you want the pieces to come together. Because otherwise, you you risk not pursuing certain interesting avenues uh, because of the privacy and security problems around it. But and I that, think the yeah. privacy by design piece is fitting within the theme, which is when I in my paper on the, the robotics conference, what I, my message was. Uh, there are going to be law cases down the road for bad incidents that haven't even occurred yet. Let's prepare today for those incidents tomorrow by, for example, trying to make our products safer today and by the internal communications, not necessarily publicizing our own vulnerabilities or other people's vulnerabilities, but within the internal risk analysis and risk management process, you can, as an enterprise, try to plan for all the possible threats and certainly the kinds of hacking into these devices would be on the threat landscape and you'd want to try to put into place controls to mitigate those kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and what I mentioned in my paper is there was a, a researcher this year who had been able to take a medical device that controls hospital systems such as an x-ray machine and use a very well-known obvious security uh, attack that exploits a well-known vulnerability and was able to compromise that device. So in other words, we, these devices that we're talking about, might, we're not talking about, oh, somebody came up with some hugely innovative attack that is previously unknown and was able to exploit this device. It's not, they are not taking care of the most basic security that they need to, to get up to the level of industry standard security. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of vulnerability that we're talking about that these devices may be vulnerable to. Mm -hmm. And, and the, it, what's interesting is, is, like, on the legal side, it's actually, in a way, the security stuff is, is not that interesting in the sense that if you release a product into the market with inadequate security, like, the FTC has the power to come after you under unfairness. I mean, that's really well established, right? So you could find yourself on the receiving end of probably a consent decree for having inadequate security. Like, these people that the OSHI found out that they, the robotics was not very, you know, those people could easily have a, have a FTC. Um, I think the legal questions become interesting where um, where the government gets involved, where the government has gone through adequate process, or the most process it can, right? So all the questions about, you know, should, the, should we need a warrant for the government to be able to access, um, you know, the cloud or things that you store in the cloud? Um, you know, should we need a warrant for that? Should we not? That's what we talk about. But if they have a warrant, that ship has sailed, right? Unless it's encrypted, it, then, you know, they have access to it. And even if it's encrypted, uh, often. Um, they can get to it. And so, like, you know, how much process? And then you have things like the Wiretap Act that requires slightly more process than the Fourth Amendment even requires and actually things like that. But there are situations like when you get enough process. Like if you get enough process in place, if you get a court to sign off on this, if you get a, the political body to sign off on this, you get a constitutional amendment, can you do some of this stuff? Do you know what I mean? Can you do my Amber Alert example if you get enough political backing and if you get enough process into place, if all the the um, uh, branches of government get together and sing Kumbaya together, you know what I mean? Like, can you then do this Amber Alert thing? Uh, you know, and so there's like sort of um, what limits are put in place just by sort of almost natural law. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like sort of like we don't want this to happen. And I think these questions about accessing memories and, and getting people to confess to things without, um, and this is where, you know, your work and Nita's work is so interesting to me where it's like process, even process may not be enough. Mentioned a couple of times, Nina Parahani mm -hmm. visited here in 2011 and is uh, due. Uh, she does, she's working on a book which we hope will come out next year called On Cognitive Liberty, mm -hmm. which focuses on a lot of these governmental and process questions that she raised. In yeah. Kind of work watch great. Work. I will, yeah, her work is great. What about the opposite possibility? The obvious possibility of computers directing the human brain? So, I, I don't know the technology well enough to tell you how far out that is, but I think it's pretty far out. 
Um, I mean, that is to say, I think it's going to be a long time before you could influence brain waves using these technologies, right, Hank? Or is that? Um, um, no, you could influence them now. Yeah. Using okay. These technologies. Right. The question is, with how much accuracy? With how much accuracy? I, I don't know that anybody thinks you could currently implant a thought in somebody's brain. Or change their mood. But what about change their mood? Well, so I don't know of anything. Mood, but certainly you can affect physical symptoms like Parkinson's disease. Yeah. And about 2% of the people who get deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease have behavioral, unanticipated behavioral sequelae. Mm. They become hyper gambling or hypersexual or mm. really lose some control over some areas. And yeah, then I, then I think so, yeah. Plus, there is this whole weird field right now of transcranial direct current stimulation, where basically you run the uh, contents of a nine, the electrical contents of a nine volt battery through your brain. You put an electrode on one side, you put an electrode on the other side, you hook it up to a nine volt battery, and um, your hair curls. Actually, your hair doesn't curl, but people, there are, there's a little bit of work, published work saying, get changes in attentiveness, alertness, some cognitive responses. There's a lot of uh, do-it-yourself of this because it just takes a 9-volt battery and a couple wires. Yeah. And people report that you know if they put it in the one spot, they get depressed. If they put it in another spot, they get happy. But that part is still pretty anecdotal. This direct, it's called um, transcranial direct current stimulation. It's a sort of offshoot of something that's a little more complicated called transcranial direct mag transcranial magnetic stimulation. Mm. That one involves a, a bit more of an expensive device, not as easy to do, that, that does the same thing magnetically. Mm. So, yeah, I don't think we're yet at the stage where, um, although there are plenty of targeted uh, of tinfoil hat people out there who think it's happening to them already, where the CIA can plant thoughts in your brain. Um, some sort of direct intervention into the brain is, is well, I was thinking more of yeah. Yeah. Well, there's this, there's, there's this stuff like controlling cockroaches by grafting on it. Uh, or monkeys, yeah. yeah. Well, th let, let, me say, let me say one other thing. Well, yeah, oh, so somebody just oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. point out the, the example I think you're thinking about. Miguel Nicolaelis at Duke mm -hmm. has done work with monkeys for a long time, including work where he's figured out what neurons fire when monkeys reach out to get a piece of fruit. Sure. And these are with implanted electrodes. And one of the nice things about implanted electrodes, they can both record and they can stimulate. So they record to figure out which pattern of firing happens when the monkey reaches out huh. to grab the fruit. He then stimulates that pattern of firing and the monkey reaches out to grab the fruit. Does the monkey think he's doing it on his own or not? Unfortunately, the monkey's not talking. What's the name? I'm just curious. Nicol Nicolaelis. Nicolaelis. N I C O L E L I S. There was also one this week. Miguel Nicolaelis. Of a brain to brain interface human to rat, uh, where a human wagged the rat's tail. No, I missed that. Thank you. That was a good one. It was just like this morning it came out in the news or something. Yeah. There you go. Half the presses. Uh, let, me, let me say one more thing about this because uh, obviously I'm, I just oh, don't know oh, the space. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. More on a medical side, but we've got a really detailed one um, with cochlear implants. Mm -hmm. So, a cochlear implant is a way for a computer to basically make you hear sounds, including music and speech, in a way you can understand, even if your outer ear doesn't work. Even if there are no vibrations in the air, you could be hearing Beethoven's Ninth mm -hmm. because the computer would stimulate, would tell a chip to stimulate your auditory nerve. One thing I do worry about, and I worry about it to the point that I'm writing an article on it right now, is not necessarily influencing you um, by directly affecting your brain, it, but actually um, the systematic exploitation of cognitive bias. In, in other words, the, the extent to which we depart from rational decision making, um, the, the way that you can figure out how people are irrational, and then uh, systematically exploit that irrationality for, say, corporate gain. Um, and so that's a paper that I'm writing right now, which I think is not 
it, you know, it's, it's, it's much more sort of old school you know, social psych, right? Um, but you, can, you have some seriously interesting behavioral outputs from that as well. So, um, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, work they've done with epilepsy victims where they were able to open up the skulls because they were looking for the source of epilepsy. And while they were in there, they put in a relatively dense mesh above the cortex and they were able to model the, uh, the process that, that generated speech better than it ever been done before. And their entire goal was that they hoped to build an interface for people who are paralyzed and have lost speech hmm. to be able to speak by, by thinking and generate artificial speech. And that's the whole goal. Wow. Um, and that's well on the way. To, to being real, they were able to characterize this, you know, those, those sort of deep structures in the brain that create speech better than anybody's been able to do so far. You know. One caution I'm going to come back to: the technology is obviously a moving target. Right now, anything that's external and non-invasive is going to be relatively limited in its sophistication, accuracy, and specificity. So the Gravity of the bunny, uh, the, the cat ears, and the game things. The idea of somebody driving their car left and right based on brain control terrifies me because what happens if they sneeze? <laughs> or what happens if you know they have a they get a distraction of some sort or another? That stuff isn't very detailed. To get really detailed stuff, at least now and I think for the near term midterm future, you probably need some sort of implantable, implanted uh, device, which it does greatly raise the stakes in terms of cost, difficulty, and willingness of somebody to do it. Yeah, but you, you can do a lot of work on the other end, right? So, so the way that example I imagine works is probably it's largely a driverless car. In, in other words, it probably doesn't need much in a way of input from the driver to begin with. Um, and so basically you're just taking suggestions to, to go right and left, and so it can do a lot of the like the Mars rover, you tell it, you know, go forward. It has to do a lot of onboard processing. And I think this is, was one of the points that was made, which was um, the, you could have the same inputs and much more sophisticated parsing and some background knowledge and increase accuracy tremendously. So that's not to say that, I mean, it is a moving target, but it's not all on the side of the inputs, I guess. Um, it could be that the, you get more sophisticated parsing of the raw data that you got. Maybe. Um, in theory, the in theory, question. empirical question, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, we do have very sophisticated, high bandwidth input output devices for the brain that are our eyes and hands and ears and so on. Mm. And in terms of non invasive ones, I think it's going to be a long time before we can match those. Invasive ones, maybe so, like the cochlear implants or the artificial retina. Yeah. You said that it, you don't think it's this, oh, there's so much information that is causing you know, to be concerned. Mm -hmm. so can you expand on what you, what you were saying that it's all part of the cultural pushback that came from? Yeah, I'm I sort of think, I struggle with how to sort of articulate this, but so imagine that, like, um, Um, imagine that you have um, a sort of graph, right? Um, and and this is, and this we'll use this really crudely, but this is the point of regulation. This is the point at which the technology, if it crosses this threshold, can be regulated. Okay, um, and this represents um, our ability to um, picture or think about what the harm might be from the surveillance, and this is actually our ability to picture. Um, what uh, uh, the violation would look like, like literally physically appear, right? Um, and so then you have something like big data um, where we can readily imagine some of the harms of big data, right? And so it has a high H, right? But it actually has a relatively low V because it's really hard for us to picture what big data violations look like. Do you know what I mean? And so then big data, um, you know, so let's just say big data goes here. Um, and so it doesn't get 
regulated. And then, you know, maybe, um, you know, Google Street View, where it drives around taking video, you know, taking uh, photos of us or whatever. So there we can really picture. It's like a car with a camera and driving around. It's terrible. So we really, as a high, you know, we have make a mental model of the violation. And so, and so maybe Street View goes here. But still, it, it doesn't end up, you know, moving over the other side. And then maybe drones, though. Drones, we have both. We have both a high a mental model of the violation and of the harm, and so maybe it goes over the threshold. And I think a lot of um, privacy literature and privacy advocacy can be thought of as trying to up one of these saliences so that it crosses over that line, show really how very harmful big data is, or help us understand through metaphor or whatever it happens to be examples why it actually you can picture what the violation looks like, right? And so, I mean, this is just really rough, but I'm just saying, like, that's what I mean. I mean, I, I mean that you're crossing some sort of made-up line, and you're doing so based on people's ability to access these, these things, yeah. Well, we're about to cross a not so made up line at 2 o'clock. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Classes and things to go to. Uh, please join me in thanking Ryan. Thanks for having me, yeah. <laughs>